order. Statement, the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And with permission, I would like to make a statement on the G20 summit in Argentina. But before I do so, I would like to put on record my thanks to President Macri for hosting such a successful summit. This was the first visit to Buenos Aires by a British Prime Minister, and only the second visit to Argentina since 2001. It came at a time of strengthening relations between our two countries, when we are seeking to work constructively with President Macri. Mr Speaker, as we leave the European Union, I have always been clear that Britain will play a full and active role on the global stage as a bold and outward-facing trading nation. We will stand up for the rules-based international order, strive to resolve with others challenges and tensions in the global economy, work with old allies and new friends for the mutual benefit of all our citizens, and remain steadfast in our determination to tackle the great challenges of our time. At this summit, we showed that the international community is capable of working through its differences constructively and the leading role the UK will continue to play in addressing shared global challenges. We agreed, along with the other G20 leaders, on the need for important reforms to the World Trade Organization to ensure it responds to changes in international trade. We pursued our objective of making sure that the global economy works for everyone and the benefits are felt by all. We called for greater action in the fight against modern slavery and tackling climate change. And I held discussions with international partners on security and economic matters, including on the progress of our exit from the European Union and the good deal an orderly exit will be for the global economy. Let me take each of these in turn. At this year's summit, I came with a clear message that Britain is open for business and that we are looking forward to future trade agreements. Once we leave the EU, we can and we will strike ambitious trade deals. For the first time in more than 40 years, we will have an independent trade policy, and we will continue to be a passionate advocate for the benefits that open economies and free markets can bring. We will forge new and ambitious economic partnerships and open up new markets for our goods and services in the fastest growing economies around the world. During the summit, I held meetings with leaders who are keen to reach ambitious free trade agreements with us as soon as possible. This includes Argentina, with whom I discussed boosting bilateral trade and investment, and I announced the appointment of a new UK trade envoy. I also discussed future trade deals with Canada, Australia, Chile and Japan, with whom we want to work quickly to establish a new economic partnership based on the EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. On the global rules that govern trade, we discussed the importance of ensuring an equal playing field and the need for the rules to keep pace with the changing nature of trade and technology. There is no doubt that the international trading system to which the United Kingdom attaches such importance is under significant strain. That is why I have repeatedly called for urgent and ambitious reform of the World Trade Organization, and at this summit I did so again. And in a significant breakthrough, we agreed on the need for important reforms to boost the effectiveness of the WTO, with a commitment to review progress at next year's G20 summit in Japan. On the global economy, we recognise the progress made in the past 10 years, with this year seeing the strongest global growth since 2011. But risks to the global economy are re-emerging. In particular, debt in lower-income countries has reached an all-time high of 224% of global GDP. So I called on members to implement the G20 guidelines on sustainable finance that we agreed last year, and which increase transparency and encourage cooperation. At this year's summit, I continue to pursue our mission to make the global economy work for everyone and the need to take action in our own countries and collectively to ensure that the benefits of economic growth are felt by all. Around the world, we are on the brink of a new era in technology which will transform lives and change the way we live. This has the potential to bring us huge benefits, but many are anxious about what it means for jobs. That is why in the UK, alongside creating the right environment for tech companies to flourish through our modern industrial strategy, we are investing in the education and skills needed so that people can make the most of the jobs and opportunities that will be created. We made strong commitments to improving women's economic empowerment, and alongside this I called on G20 leaders to take practical action to ensure that by 2030 all girls, not just in our own countries but around the world, get 12 years of quality education. To build fair economies and inclusive societies, we must tackle injustice wherever we find it. 
Around the world, we must all do more to end the horrific practice of modern slavery and protect vulnerable men, women and children from being abused and exploited in the name of profit. Two years ago, I put modern slavery on the G20 agenda at my first summit, and this year I was pleased to give my full support to the G20's strategy to eradicate modern slavery from the world of work. And I announced that next year, the Government will publish the steps we are taking to identify and prevent slavery in the UK Government's supply chains in our own transparency statement. This is a huge challenge. Last financial year, the UK Government spent £47 billion on public procurement, demonstrating just how important this task is. I urge the other leaders around the G20 table to work with us and ensure that their supply chains are free from slavery as we work to bring an end to this appalling crime. On climate change, I made clear the UK's determination to lead the way on the serious threat this poses to our planet. We need a step change in preparing for temperature rises, to cut the cost and impact of climate-related disasters, and to secure food, water and jobs for the future. As a UN champion on climate resilience, the UK will continue to pursue this agenda at next year's UN Climate Summit. Nineteen of us at the G20 reaffirmed our commitment to the Paris Agreement, but it remains a disappointment that the United States continues to opt out. I also announced that the UK will be committing £100 million to the Renewable Energy Performance Platform, which will directly support the private sector in leveraging private finance to fund renewable energy products in sub-Saharan Africa. Mr Speaker, this summit also gave me the opportunity to discuss important matters directly with other leaders and raise concerns openly and frankly. In that context, I met Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, first to stress the importance of a full, transparent and credible investigation into the terrible murder of Jamal Khashoggi and for those responsible to be held to account, a matter which I also discussed with President Erdogan, and second, to urge an end to the conflict in Yemen and relief for those suffering from starvation and to press for progress at the upcoming talks in Stockholm. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia is important to this country, but that does not prevent us from putting forward robust views on these matters of grave concern. I also discussed the situation in Ukraine with a number of G20 leaders. The UK condemns Russian aggression in the Black Sea and calls for the release of the 24 Ukrainian service personnel detained and their three vessels. Mr Speaker, at this year's summit we reached important agreements demonstrating the continued importance of the G20 and international cooperation. It also demonstrated the role that a global Britain will play on the world stage as we work with our friends and partners around the world to address shared challenges and bolster global prosperity. And I commend this statement to the House. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Prime Minister for the advanced copy of her statement. This G20 summit met 10 years after the global financial crash, and the 20 nations that control 85% of the world's GDP have been too slow to reject the failed neoliberal economic model that caused the crisis in the first place. But, Mr Speaker, there are signs of change. On There are signs of change. On Saturday, I attended the inauguration of a G20 leader, President López Obrador of Mexico, who has won a significant mandate for change to the corruption, environmental degradation and economic failure of the past. Of course, Mr Speaker, some G20 countries have no such democratic mechanisms. So while economics are important, our belief, our belief in universal human rights and democratic principles must never be subservient to them. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister told the media she would... The... Do be quiet, it's awfully boring and terribly juvenile. The order... The Prime Minister was heard and overwhelmingly with courtesy. The same will apply in respect of the Leader of the Opposition. It doesn't matter how long it takes, I've got all the time in the day. That is what will happen. Please try to grasp this rather simple truth. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister told the media she would sit down and be robust with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The Chief Architect of the Brutal War in Yemen, 
which has killed 56,000 people and brought 14 million to the brink of famine. The Crown Prince is believed to have ordered the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Rather than be robust, as she promised, we learn, the Prime Minister told the dictator, please don't use the weapons you are, we are selling you in the war you're waging, and asked him nicely to investigate the murder he allegedly ordered. <laughs> Leaders should not just offer warm words against human rights atrocities, but back up their words with action. Germany, the Netherlands, Norway and others have stopped their arms sales to Saudi Arabia. When will the United Kingdom do the same? On Ukraine, as NATO has said, we need both sides to show restraint and de-escalate with international law adhered to, including Russia allowing unhindered access to Ukraine's ports on the Sea of Azov. Britain's trade policy must be led by clear principles that do not sacrifice human rights. The International Trade Secretary claimed last summer that a trade deal between the UK and the EU would be the easiest in human history. Yet all we have before us is 26 pages of vague aspirations. It seems that neither has he got very far on the 40 trade deals he would be ready to sign the day we leave next year, unless the Prime Minister can update us in her response. And in light of last week's report from the Foreign Affairs Committee, how does the Prime Minister intend to ensure the 240 expert trade negotiators she promised by Brexit Day will be in place, given they've had two years and there are only 90 currently in post? Mr Speaker, did the Prime Minister speak again to President Trump at the G20? He seems to have rejected the Prime Minister's Brexit agreement because it doesn't put America first. The International Trade Secretary claimed bilateral US and UK trade could rise by £40 billion a year by 2030 if we are able to remove the barriers to trade that we have, his words. The Prime Minister claims that under her deal we can and we will strike ambitious trade deals. But this morning we learned that Britain's top civil servant in charge of these negotiations wrote to the Prime Minister admitting there is no legal guarantee to being able to end the backstop. However, it is clear that some of her government do want to remove barriers. Just this weekend, the Environment Secretary said with regards to the Brexit deal and workers' rights, it allows us to diverge and have flexibility. Our flexible labour market already means that the UK has the weakest wage growth of all of the G20 nations. Did the Prime Minister ask the other leaders how they fared so much better? UK capital investment is also the second worst in the G20. The previous Chancellor slashed UK corporation tax to the lowest level in the G20, telling us it would... In doing so, Mr Speaker, he told us it would boost investment. It didn't. So did the Prime Minister ask the other G20 leaders why, despite, despite higher corporation tax, they attract much higher investment? Given the G20 is responsible for 76 per cent of carbon dioxide emissions, I welcome the fact that uh, building consensus for a fair and sustainable development was the theme of the summit. Why then did her government vote against Labour's proposal to include sustainable development goals as a reference point when the Trade Bill was put before Parliament earlier this year? If present trends continue, many G20 nations will not meet their Paris 2015 commitments. And I'm glad the Government will pursue this agenda at next year's UN Climate Summit and hope that this Government is pursuing it also this week in the talks at Katowice in Poland. As climate change is the biggest issue facing our world, it is imperative that a sustainable economic trade model is put forward that puts people and the planet over profit. Our country has the lowest wage growth in the G20, the lowest investment and poor productivity. Ten years on from the global financial crisis, this Prime Minister 
and too much of the G20 have simply failed to learn the lessons of that crash. Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the right honourable gentleman ranged over quite a, a number of issues in his uh, response. Perhaps I can just uh, pick out some of those key ones. First of all, first of all I'm, as I made absolutely clear, both I, with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the Foreign Secretary, with uh, King Salman himself, and my, uh, my conversations with King Salman, and other interactions with Saudi Arabia, we have been absolutely robust in our response in relation to the terrible murder of Jamal Khashoggi and very clear uh, about the need for those responsible to be held to account. He referenced the war in Yemen. I might remind the right honourable gentleman that the coalition intervention in the Yemen was actually requested by the legitimate government of the Yemen and has been acknowledged by the United Nations Security Council. He asked, whether, he asked whether I spoke to President Trump. I did speak to President Trump in the margins of the meeting. I was clear with him that we can indeed do a trade deal with the United States of America with the deal that is on the table with the, uh, with the European Union. And, uh, and we recognised recognise the work that the working group that, has been, that is in existence between the UK and the USA, looking at those trade arrangements for the future, uh, has been making good progress in those. Uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman also made various other uh, references to the issues around trade. Yes, I did discuss trade with a number of the leaders, other leaders that I met, particularly uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan was very clear in his remarks that he looks forward to being able to discuss the uh, United Kingdom's uh, possible membership of the CPTPP. Indeed, that was echoed by others uh, with whom I spoke at the, uh, at the G20 summit. Um, he also referenced these, made various references to uh, the issue of uh, trade in his remarks. I'm very interested that he made reference, so many references to trade because, of course, he used to want to do trade deals with other countries and put it in his manifesto. But just last week, he said he didn't want to do trade deals after all. Now, those trade deals will be important to the economy of this country in the future, and we certainly are committed to those trade deals around the rest of the world. Um, he then talked about corporation tax. I might remind him that, yes, we have cut corporation tax. That's been of benefit to businesses, employers and jobs in this country. And, and guess what? We cut corporation tax and we're raising more money from it as a result. We have, uh, we have employment at record levels and we're the first choice in Europe for foreign direct investment. Uh, but one thing that I perhaps did omit from mentioning in my statement was that some of the other conversations I had with leaders of countries in South America uh, was them reflecting on the migration problem that has been caused by the terrible situation of the economy in Venezuela. Mr Kenneth Clark. Mr Speaker, uh, as the Prime Minister apparently did discuss with uh, President Trump, question of future trade arrangements with America, did the President indicate any area of the American market, uh, such as public procurement or financial or other services, that he might be considering opening up to us? Uh, and if he repeated his request that we should open ourselves up fully to food imports, did she explain to him that we are unwilling to abandon the European standards we developed over the years to accept lower standards set by Congress as he wishes, and that he really must adjust to the fact that we cannot forfeit all our other overseas markets in order to allow him to export food to this country. Prime Minister, My learned friend raises two aspects of a potential deal, uh, trade deal with the United States of America. I have been very clear, uh, indeed, to uh, a number of people in relation to this issue of agricultural products that actually this isn't a question of our membership of the EU or our adoption of EU standards. There is actually a question for everybody. Will be a question for everybody in this country about the standards we want to continue to have in terms of agricultural products in the future. On the issue of opening up the American uh, market to, in terms of public procurement and financial services, these are exactly the issues that the working group that, exists, that is uh, operating between us and the United States are looking at. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of her statement and join her in congratulating 
President Macri on Argentina's presidency of the G20. Mr. Speaker, it is pleasing to hear that President Macri and the Prime Minister have productive talks on trade and investment. Perhaps the Prime Minister will share more details with the House on the content of these discussions. Given the status strains on international diplomacy at this time, it is welcome that the G20 was able to come together and deliver a joint statement of endeavour. The communique itself is clearly a compromise agreement, but falls short in a number of areas. In particular, the pledge to look at WTO reform requires further explanation from the Prime Minister in terms of what reforms she believes is needed and why. Also, in terms of the refugee crisis and our responsibilities, it seems that the communique has the bare minimum commitment rather than real ambition. Mr Speaker, this is particularly shocking given that this week marks the 80th anniversary of the kinder transport, the journey of children who fled the Nazis. We should still have that generosity of spirit for refugees in this country today. I do, however, agree with the Prime Minister's sentiments about how important the G20 is to international economic cooperation and welcome that commitments have been made to work together on economic opportunities and the greatest threat to our generation, climate change. However, I note that the press release the Prime Minister explained how the summit gave her the opportunity to update leaders on her Brexit plans. Did the Prime Minister share with the world leaders any concern that her deal is a lame duck? There are many questions for the Prime Minister to answer. Could the Prime Minister explain how she was discussing trade agreements when she wouldn't be able to strike any deals until after the transition? Furthermore, can the Prime Minister give us an explanation on how any of these discussions can take place when the backstop comes in? As she confirmed in the House last Monday, the UK won't be able to have any independent trade deals. Does the Prime Minister see the direct contradiction in her claims of working in collaboration and partnership to deliver economic prosperity when her Brexit deal rips economic stability and opportunity from beneath our feet by taking us out of the European Union. Well, I can see the Prime Minister shaking her head, but that's the reality. Young people that are going to be denied the opportunities that our generation has had. At the summit, did the Prime Minister use her time to discuss pressing human rights issues? What discussions did she have And did she raise the matter of the Khashoggi's death with Mohammed bin Salman? And finally, will the Prime Minister share with us an update on her government's actions over the past two years to tackle climate change? Or has she been too distracted to get on with the real job of government? Prime Minister. Can I say to the uh, the right honourable gentleman? First of all, he asked me about WTO reform. The issues, just to give him an example of a couple of the issues that I raised in relation to WTO uh, reform, and I think these are recognised in, in conversations with others, recognised as issues that need to be addressed. One is the whole dispute resolution mechanism, which is too slow. Everybody recognises that it is too slow. If you are going to be able to have faith in the rules that are set by the WTO, you need to be able to have a dispute resolution mechanism in which people can have faith as well. Uh, Another area which is of key concern to people, looking at the uh, digital economy, is uh, the very slow progress that WTO has made in that area, the very slow progress they've made on looking at the whole area of e-commerce. These are just two of the issues that will be uh, referenced in relation to the uh, uh, WTO reform. Um, He talked about uh, uh, trade deals and about whether, as he said, I was listening quite carefully, I think he said we wouldn't be able to strike trade deals until after the um, transition period after the implementation period. That is not correct. During that transition or implementation period, we will be able to negotiate, sign and ratify trade deals, which can then come into operation at the end of the implementation period. Uh, and I did, I think we should all, I hope we will all welcome the growing and de- developing um, uh, bilateral relationship that the UK has with Argentina. And I was pleased to be able to welcome, when I was there, the uh, extra flight that is now uh, going to take place from the Falkland Islands to um, via Cordoba to uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, and then he, he asked about pressing human rights issues and had any pressing human rights issues been raised. I specifically referenced in my statement a human rights issue on which this government has been leading the world in terms of action, uh, and that is in, in terms of modern slavery. Many countries around the, oh, the 
from the sedentary position. The Honourable Lady says not true. It is true. If you look at the Modern Slavery Act, if you look at the Modern Slavery Act, and I'm pleased to say that recently the Australians are now introducing legislation which, which actually mirrors the legislation we've put in relation to supply chains, and I encourage other countries around the world to do the same. Anna Subri. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what was quite striking for many people when they saw the photograph, apart from Christine Legrand, who of course is the chief of the IMF, was that the Prime Minister, because Mrs. Merkel's plane didn't quite make it, but the Prime Minister was the only other woman in the photograph. And the lack of women's leaders is really striking. She rightly says, having put modern slavery onto the G20 agenda two years ago, that part of the purpose of the G20 is to build fair economies and inclusive societies, and in doing that we must tackle injustice. Could she tell us what does she hope to achieve in tackling the injustice of not enough women being involved in all these G20 countries at all levels of government, and especially at the top? That's enough for me. <laughs> Well, I think Minister. my right honourable friend and I both share the desire to encourage more women to come into politics, not just here in the UK, but to see more women able to take senior positions in uh, the political world uh, around in, other, uh, in those other countries as well. And it is, you know, we have a good record here in terms overall of women's employment. I think there is still more for us to do to encourage more women to see politics as a career that they want to come into. I think to do that, we do need to tackle some of the problems that have arisen uh, in terms of the harassment and bullying that sometimes women uh, politicians receive, particularly in relation to social media uh, 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 concerns that, uh, that people have. Um, but the, the fact of the lack of female leaders sitting around the table, and the, uh, until Chancellor Merkel arrived, I was the only uh, leader of, uh, head of government, a female head of government there, was one that was raised uh, not just, in fact, by Christine Lagarde, but also by other leaders around the table too. Sir Vincent Cable. Uh, will the Prime Minister undertake to build on her role as candid friend to Prince Mohammed and the Saudi regime uh, by making an appeal for clemency on behalf of 12 men who currently face imminent execution after torture for the crime of practising a different religion? Prime Minister. I say to, uh, the right honourable gentleman that we do regularly raise individual cases with the uh, with the Saudi Arabian government, and uh, when. At every time that I meet with the Saudi Arabian government, we talk about human rights issues. Um, but I'm sure the Foreign Office will look at the particular case that he's talking about. Sir Roger Gale. Mr Speaker, from the G20, did my right honourable friend gain the impression that beyond the European Union there's a big wide world waiting and wanting to do business with the United Kingdom? And contrary to the impression that was sought to be given by the spokesman from the Scottish Nationalist Party, is it not correct that within the withdrawal agreement, it is perfectly possible for us to strike and sign deals ready for implementation immediately upon the end of the transition period. The Minister. Uh, can I say to my honourable friend that I am able to give him that uh, confirmation uh, that he has sought in relation to those issues, and particularly on the second point, it is absolutely the case that during the implementation period, the transition period, we will be able to negotiate, to sign, to ratify uh, trade deals with other countries around, uh, around the world, and indeed there may be aspects of those trade deals that we are able to bring into practice. Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, this year, as the Prime Minister knows, is the 10th anniversary of the Climate Change. Act. I welcome what the Prime Minister said about providing that leadership role at the UN Climate uh, uh, Summit next year, but our own country is not on track to meet the fourth and fifth cli uh, carbon budgets. So what are we going to do to provide real leadership at the G20 on these issues and get back on track to meet those important fourth and fifth carbon budgets? <laughs> Well, I think that the first thing is to actually show by the example that, that we have, and it was indeed, uh, as the Honourable Lady says, it, ten years ago that that Climate Change Act came into place. I think that was an important step. I think that showed leadership here in the UK. We must continue to do that. But another aspect that we're also leading on is encouraging uh, a great, greater development of resilience to climate change. As we look around the world, there are many, uh, particularly Pacific Islands, who will be significantly affected by climate change, helping those and others, for example, in the Caribbean to build their resilience, I think is important too. Mr. Nicholas Soam. Mr. Speaker, would my right honourable friend elaborate on what executive actions beyond condemnation the G20 partners agreed 
on Russia's blatant and wholly unacceptable piracy yeah, 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 yeah. in the Sea of Azov and the wider Black Sea. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister! The, the, the G20 was clear, as my right honourable friend has indicated in its condemnation of this, uh, of this action. Uh, the, the, or there was discussion among the G20 leaders in terms of condemnation of this action. Of course, one of the G20 leaders is indeed President Putin. Who, uh, so, but, uh, the, and that is why the question of executive action is one that I think will be taking another fora. We as the UK have been one of the leaders in pressing for sanctions in the European Union uh, against uh, Russia for activity in the Ukraine, and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Caroline Lucas. Mr Speaker, speaking today at the UN Climate Summit, Sir David Attenborough told world leaders that the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. That is a very stark warning. I welcome the government's contribution to the renewable energy platform, but can the Prime Minister explain why the government is refusing to engage in the important fossil fuel subsidy peer review process, which is being led by the G20, despite the UK handing out billions to dirty energy every single year? Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady that we do uh, recognise the significance of climate change. We also recognise, she referenced a quote from David Attenborough there, actually we recognise um, the importance of action in other areas as well, such as the protection of species around the world. That's why we had the, held the conference in October here in the UK on the international wildlife trade, which is very, another aspect of the, the future of our world. And in relation to energy sources, we do believe in having a, a mixed, uh, a mixed uh, economy in relation to, uh, in relation to those sources. Um, but we are, of course, one of the members of and encouraging others to become members of the power, Powering Past Coal Alliance. Yeah. Yeah, John Whittingdale. Um, can I thank my right old friend for the support of, her, of the government for Ukraine in the face of increased Russian aggression? Will, he look, will she look at ways in which we can step up pressure on Russia to release not just the 24 sailors but also the 68 other Ukrainian political prisoners held in occupied Crimea and in Russia, and also to cease uh, the blockade of Berdyansk and Mariupol in the Sea of Azov? Yes. Well, my, as my right honourable friend points out, uh, this is not the only example of Russian aggression. And in fact, what we have seen is this is, fits into a pattern of Russian behaviour. We will indeed continue to press for uh, appropriate action to be taken in these uh, matters. As I've said in response to a previous question, the UK has been leading in the EU in pressing for sanctions, and we will continue to do so. And I look forward to discussing with other EU leaders further steps that can be taken. Chris Brown. Mr. Speaker, uh, members from across the House campaigned for a Magnitsky Act to deal with the human rights abuses in Russia and other countries, and we were delighted when it made its way into the provisions of the Sanctions and Anti Money Laundering Act. But the Foreign Office is dragging its heels. It's not implemented any of this yet. Can the Prime Minister please chivy along the Foreign Secretary to make sure that we get this in place as soon as possible? It's something we could do now. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that, of course, we will look, I will ensure that the Foreign Office is looking at this, uh, this issue. We are encouraging, with the Dutch, uh, others more widely to take on this, uh, this uh, concept of the human rights related Magnitsky Act. But there is a limit to what we can do in terms of the of, uh, individual imposition of sanctions until we leave the European Union. <laughs> and Vicky Ford. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for pointing out that an orderly exit is to benefit the entire yeah, world's yeah. economy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the backstop, the UK will have tariff-free, quota-free access to the entire single market, yeah. but we will not be paying contributions to the EU budget or following EU rules on free movement. Who should be more uncomfortable, the UK? Or the EU? Yeah, yeah. Well, can I say to my honourable friend that it is, of course, precisely because in that circumstance, we, should it come into place, we would be able to have that access without paying and without ex having to have free movement, that it m makes the EU very uncomfortable about the prospect of the United Kingdom being in the backstop. Yeah, yeah. Mary Chairman. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister mentioned that. Um, on the margin of the summit, she spoke to President Trump about trade policy. Um, is she aware that back home this uh, summit didn't look that inspirational? 
but could she tell us, uh, in informal talks on the margin, did she have good talks with European allies, and did she get any really good bonuses out of the conversations? The Minister! Bonuses. Um, I had a number of uh, discussions with European allies, but I, actually I focused my meetings at this uh, G20 summit on those who I otherwise don't normally get the opportunity to speak to in the same way as I do with uh, European leaders. And that's why I was pleased to have bilaterals with Prime Minister Trudeau, with Prime Minister Abe, President Erdogan. I've referenced the one uh, on particular issues with, uh, with Saudi Arabia, and indeed with President Macri of Argentina and, and, uh, and with the President of Chile as well. And Mr. Stephen Crabb. Speaker, the Prime Minister continues to show commitment to the world's poorest nations. So, in her ongoing discussions with G20 <laughs> allies, would she urge them to step up to the plate and ensure that next year's replenishment round for the Global Fund to tackle AIDS, TB, and malaria is full and effective, and so the world can take another step forward in fighting these killer diseases? Just, uh... Yeah, well, I'm very happy to take up the issue that my right honourable friend has referenced. And there was recognition of the issues around HIV and AIDS. Of course, uh, one of the days of the summit was World AIDS Day. And I think this is one of those issues where everybody around that table recognises there is still work for us to do. Mary Cray. Speaker, when she was discussing the brave new world of uh, post Brexit free trade deals with world leaders, did any of them point out the supreme irony? that her own Treasury forecasts show that they can only be achieved by reducing the amount of free trade that we do with our nearest market of 500 million people and by losing access to 33, 36 other free trade, free trade deals that our membership of the European Union currently gives us. The lady will know we are working on the continuity arrangements for those uh, trade deals that currently exist between the EU and the uh, and various countries around the world. And it is not right to say uh, that it is only um, by not having that trade relationship with the EU that we can have trade relationships around the rest of the world. There is a recognition, both in the political declaration and in uh, our, the government's own proposals, that we can have a good trading relationship with the EU and good trading relationships different. From from those that currently exist with other countries around the world. Uh, Dr Julian Lewis. The Prime Minister's mention of the World Trade Organisation reminds me that the Chancellor in his budget wisely allocated three to four billion pounds for practical preparations for exiting the EU on a WTO basis. Has each government department now received its allocated share of these funds, and if not, why are they being held back? Prime Minister. Uh, the funds are not being held back, and government departments will receive their allocation of, notification of the allocation of the funds in the next few days. Alison Thewlis. Mr. Speaker, the Yemen Data Project uh, reported that over the course of 10 days, 40, 42 airstrikes uh, happened, and 62% of those hit civilian targets. Did the Prime Minister discuss with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman how the bombs she sold him will be used in the coming month? Prime Minister. What I did discuss with the Crown Prince was the need to find a political solution to the issue, the, what is happening in the conflict in the Yemen. This is very important. There are due, talks due to take place in Stockholm. I have encouraged all parties to take part in those talks. The, own, the way to resolve the issue in the Le Yemen is through a long-term political solution. This is Anne Main. Speaker, uh, the Prime Minister has twice given assurances to the House now today that we can indeed do trade deals and that those deals can be signed and ratified, but not implemented until we have left the transition period. Can she confirm what the status of those trade deals would be should we go into the backstop period? Prime Minister. There are uh, some restrictions that the backstop would, uh, would require uh, in relation to trade deals. Notably, we would be applying the common external tariff, but there would be some uh, freedom for us in relation, to, uh, in, relation to these, uh, in relation to these matters in terms of trade with other countries around the world. Uh, I'm, but I'm glad that my hon. Friend has repeated the confirmation that I've given that it would be possible during the transition period to... Uh, ratify, to negotiate and to sign up to those uh, trade deals. And of course it is the intention of the Government, and clearly stated the intention of the European Union, uh, that at the end of that implementation period we will be in a position to operate those trade deals. Mike Gates. 
Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister referred to a pattern of Russian behaviour and she's also condemned the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Did she also have an opportunity in her conversations with Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman or with uh, President Erdogan to talk about Syria and the continuing crimes being carried out by Russia and its Iranian and Houthi allies in Syria? Prime Minister. The, the issues around Syria are ones which we regularly raise with, uh, with uh, other partners uh, in a, a variety of ways. We recognise the continue, continuing problems in relation to Syria. The, the, uh, of course, again, a long-term solution can only come with a political solution in, in, uh, in Syria. It is good that we have seen some uh, 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 limitation of action taking place in certain parts of Syria in recent months, but obviously we have also sadly seen continuing action uh, against people in Syria. Maggie through. Speaker, I welcome my Honourable Friend's announcement that the Government will be taking steps to eradicate slavery in its supply chain, as it was an issue I highlighted in the Private Members Bill a couple of years ago. Uh, but does she agree with me that it is an issue that everyone in this House should be able to be, be united on? Yes. Well, Prime Minister. To, my Honourable Friend, I think it is absolutely the case that this eradication of modern slavery is an issue which everybody across this whole House should be working towards and should be supporting the Government's efforts in this area. The Modern Slavery Act was an important step, but there is much more for us to do, and that is why we are continuing to, uh, to press forward on further action on this. Gavin Robinson. Much, Mr Speaker. The high five between President Putin and Crown Prince uh, ben Salman may have seemed jovial, but it comes with it uh, the undertone of geopolitical significant relationships. Uh, does the Prime Minister, or did the Prime Minister, have any discussions with our NATO allies in supporting the international rules-based order, which she mentioned, not only encouraging compliance, but perhaps coercing compliance? Prime Minister. I certainly uh, had a number of conversations which were about exactly the point of, of maintaining the international rules based order. We, we recognise that in a number of different areas this is under significant pressure, um, uh, but we have been leading in some areas to ensure that it, that it continues, not least, of course, uh, in the work that we have done in the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. James Cleverly. Speaker, uh, amongst the members of the G20 are some countries who only a few decades ago were in crushing poverty themselves. Will she reject the uh, calls to move away from liberal free market economics and actually promote that as an agenda, removing uh, tariff barriers imposed by wealthy countries and using free trade to lift other poor nations and people around the world out of that poverty. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right. It is trade that develops economies, that helps to lift poor countries uh, out of their poverty, that helps to provide for people within those countries. And one of the points I made at the summit was that the increasing uh, protectionism that we see, the increasing pressure on the rules-based international order in relation to trade, will only hit the poorest hardest. Emma Reynolds. Speaker, the Japanese Prime Minister clearly doesn't want Japanese companies like Honda and Nissan to face friction at the UK-EU border. When will the Prime Minister be clear that there is a trade-off between, on the one hand, retaining the frictionless access um, to EU markets we currently enjoy, but which won't be in place after the transition period in her deal, and on the other hand, striking free trade deals with other countries around exactly. the world? Yeah. Minister. Well, first of all, the Honourable Lady has made an assumption about what the political declaration. If she looks at the political declaration, she will she see the ambition that is there in relation to the future trading relationships with the European Union. But yes, there is a balance for us in that relationship with the EU between uh, uh, an acceptance of, uh, of rules and standards uh, versus the sort of custom uh, checks that take place in relation to frictionless trade. The Government has recognised that. We did that when we published the White Paper in the summer. But that does not mean that we cannot sign train deal, trade deals with the rest of the world. We will be able to sign those trade deals around the world. Mr Philip Davis. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister referenced her deal with the EU. I just wondered, could she tell us, uh, before she embarked on the negotiations with the European Union, what are the top three successful negotiations that the Prime Minister has uh, negotiated? Well, Prime Minister. 
Well, I'm tempted to. I'll tell my honourable friend one of the negotiations that I successfully negotiated. When I became Home Secretary, I was told that the exchange of passenger name records across the European Union would be a very useful means of, uh, would be very important in improving our security against terrorists and organised criminals. I was also told that we were the only country that wanted it, and therefore it could not happen inside the European Union. What do we now see? By painstaking work, because I refused to accept that view, we have a passenger name records directive. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There is a time in politics when words are not enough. 56,000 people killed, 14 million living through a humanitarian crisis in Yemen. What is her price to ensure human rights are more important than blood money from the sale of arms? Prime Minister. To the Honourable Lady. The the, the question of uh, providing for those people who are suffering terribly in the Yemen today is about ensuring that there is a political solution in the Yemen. That is what we believe there is an opportunity for that now. That is what we have been encouraging all the parties to come together for. That is why the talks that are going to take place over the coming days and weeks in Stockholm are so important. Andrew Bowie. Speaker, whilst the G20 was meeting in Argentina, the COP24 conference was gathering in Poland. So, would my right honourable friend reaffirm our commitment to maintaining our world leading position on climate change resilience and our commitment to meet our obligations as agreed in Paris three years ago, no matter the position of our closest ally in the United States or our future relationship with the European Union? Prime Minister. I'm very happy to give our continued commitment to the, uh, uh, to the obligations that we, have, uh, that we signed up to. Um, in fact, if we look at what happened in the Paris Accord, my right honourable friend, now the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, in her previous role in energy, uh, was a leading figure in helping to ensure that that Paris Accord came together, and we remain committed to it. Tom Bray. Mr Speaker, returning to the Japanese Prime Minister, he asked our Prime Minister to rule out no deal. Will she? Minister. I have negotiated a good deal for the UK with the European Union. Daniel Kaczynski. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I hope during the course of the summit the Prime Minister managed to speak to the Brazilian President, Mr Temer about his successor, Mr Bolsonaro, who takes over on the 31st of this month. His virulent anti-homophobic remarks during the election campaign are unacceptable and unconducive to good relations with the United Kingdom. The, uh, my honourable friend, that of course the incoming president who uh, made those remarks was not there at the G20 summit, as he said it was the current president, Temer, who, uh, who was there. But we will continue to be clear with all countries around the world the importance that we attach to equal rights and the importance we attach to human rights. Uh, Dr. Rupa Huck. Mr. Speaker, can I congratulate the Prime Minister on all the air miles she's clocked up recently <laughs> on our behalf? And can I urge the uh, government not to forget its promises on anti corruption? So the G20 declaration commits leaders to tackling vulnerabilities in the financial system. And what with the National Crime Agency, which she, as she reminded us, had a hand in setting up, estimating that hundreds of billions of pounds are at the moment being laundered through uh, the UK. Could she give us a date when the commitment to consult on creating a criminal offence of failure to prevent for corporations on money laundering will materialise so that we can practise what we preach? Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady, I mean, thank you for the uh, uh, remarks that she made. I did set up the National Crime Agency. It is doing important work in this area. The new Economic Com- uh, Crime Centre, which has been set up, is an important step in dealing with these issues. We continue to look at the powers that are necessary in order to deal with this, but we have already introduced new powers that enable us to take action against those involved in these matters. Oh. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I refer my right honourable friend to what she said about renewable energy projects in sub-Saharan Africa. How will this support the target of 30% of renewable energy in Nigeria, a country which cannot provide electricity to half its population? My Minister. My uh, honourable friend for, for uh, pointing that out. Uh, the point of the intervention that we're making, the money, the money we're making available, is this will help to leverage private finance. It is by government working together with private finance that we will be able to ensure um, that we see those projects being able to come on board in a number of countries around Africa. Uh, Jonathan Edwards. 
Barry and uh, Mr Speaker. If the Prime Minister's Brexit proposals are implemented, the trade deals she talks about will have to concentrate, concentrate primarily on services as opposed to goods. Will she make a commitment, therefore, to rule out using public services as a bargaining chip? Minister. We've uh, always been very clear in relation to these, uh, to these matters of, uh, in relation to public services. There will be. I mean, this, the, the economy of the United Kingdom uh, does rely significantly on services in relation to uh, that's one of the areas in which we are particularly leading across the world. And I expect that we will be able to ensure that the trade deals that we do around the world do incorporate uh, those aspects of services where we are leading. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I might return to the subject of the sixth replenishment of the Global Fund to continue the fight against HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, can my right honourable friend confirm from her engagement with the US administration that the United States, currently the biggest donor to the fund, shares her commitment? I'm very happy to say to my honourable friend that, obviously, as he has said, we restated the commitment to ending HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. I think it's an important, the G20 is an important venue for doing that, but indeed President Trump did, in uh, one of his interventions at the summit, make reference to the need for the work that continues to be made in terms of HIV. John Woodcock. Speaker, the Prime Minister understands the supreme importance of cross-border national security. She also understands how difficult and long a process it is inevitably to agree and ratify new treaties. So will she level with this House and the public that there is actually very little chance of being able to agree and then fully ratify a new security treaty by the end of the transition period? I I have a different uh, opinion from the Honourable Gentleman. We've got clear um, uh, structure within the political declaration in relation to that. I simply say to him, the December joint report uh, on withdrawal was 16 pages. Within less than a year, we've negotiated 585, nearly 590 pages of legal text. The political declaration is, uh, I think, 26 pages. It's perfectly possible to negotiate on all aspects of that within the two years available. Henry Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Next week in Marrakesh, a UN conference takes place on migration, uh, yet there are considerable concerns among some G20 and EU uh, member countries, Italy, for example, uh, at the provisions of that. Uh, was uh, this discussed at the G20 uh, summit, and what is Her Majesty's Government's position on this? Prime Minister. My honourable friend is absolutely right, and it was. Seemly. I, I, I'm bound to say, I think the Honourable Member Crawley was entitled to a, a somewhat more respectful welcome. I think his constituents were entitled to hear him heard with greater courtesy. And now the Prime Minister is replying this great hubbub of voluble and unnecessary noise should cease. Let's hear the Prime Minister's reply. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Speaker. Um, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Of course, with the um, launch event of the Global Compact for Migration next week. It was absolutely right that migration is being discussed in a number of, uh, a number of fora, and uh, including, obviously, the references that we saw in the communique that, was, uh, that came out of the G20 summit. I think that Global Compact is one way when we can bolster international cooperation on these uh, areas, because it does set an approach to reduce irregular or illegal migration whilst improving regular and managed migration. And I think it enables all states to effectively manage our borders. Uh, So this issue is an issue which is recognised across the G20 as one that needs to be addressed. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When she met the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, did she discuss with him the 11 exchanges that our American allies said that he had with the leader of the hit squad who murdered and dismembered Mr Kash Hoggy at around the time of those events. And if so, is she happy still to be described as she was by the the leader of the Liberal Democrats as a candid friend of the Saudi Crown Prince? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, the point I made to the the, uh, Saudi Crown Prince was a very simple one. Everybody needs to be uh, absolutely confident that the Saudi Arabian investigation is full, is proper, is credible and is transparent. That is what we are encouraging them to ensure that they, uh, that they do. I also discussed the nature of the investigations with President Erdogan. 
That woman. Mr Speaker, it's the rise of technology that will change more lives across the G20 than any other factor. Can the Prime Minister restate her commitment to increase our spending on research and development so that we, as in this country, make the most of the opportunities? Prime Minister. Well, the is absolutely right. We have a firm commitment as a government to increase the percentage of GDP being spent on research and development to 2.4%. That is both public and private sector investment. This is the way in which we can ensure that we're investing in the jobs of the future. Debbie Abraham. Uh, today is International Disability Day, and with over 1 billion disabled people worldwide, and that number set to increase, was the equality and empowerment of disabled people discussed at the G20? And if not, will the Prime Minister commit to discussing it at a future meeting? The, the, Prime Minister. The importance, what was discussed was the importance of ensuring that economic development benefits all people, and that includes those who, uh, includes those who currently feel they are not benefiting from it, but includes, obviously does include disabled people. There are a number of events around the margins of the G20 also which addressed a number of these issues. Chris Phil. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister mentioned in her statement the importance of securing free trade deals around the world. And yet some members of this House are proposing the so-called Norway Plus option, membership of the single market and the EU customs union, most likely with a backstop. Does she agree that would prevent free trade deals being done, would still be paying money in, and there would be unlimited free movement? And would she join with me in saying that would be an extremely bad choice for our country to take? Well, I'm, I'm happy to uh, confirm what my honourable friend has said. That option indeed would mean that we were continuing to pay, that we had to accept free movement, that we accepted also the Norway Plus model is, has that uh, issue of the uh, customs union. What we have negotiated for the United Kingdom is a, a deal that is right for the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, I'm pleased that Prime Minister recognises the importance of an equal playing field with respect to trade. Will this also apply to the contract for the fleet solid supply ships? And can the Prime Minister assure our UK shipbuilders that foreign government sponsored bids will be ruled out? Yeah, yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, she will be aware that we have developed a national shipbuilding strategy. I think this is an important step forward which will support shipbuilders around the UK. Yeah. And Martin Whitfield. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. By 2030, um, each girl is guaranteed 12 years of education. Could the Right Honourable Prime Minister confirm what the commitment from the G20, and in particular this country, is to achieve it by 2030? Yeah, well, yes, we have already. We are already one of the countries that is putting significant funds from our international development funding into this whole question of girls' education, and we will be continuing to do so. Thank you. Order.